Good morning, good afternoon and good night learners. Let's learn the law, truth, myth or mixture. This module explores the criminal law and courts of England and Wales. Unit 1 shows that some common ideas about them may not be entirely true. It examines those ideas and reveals the realities behind them. By doing so, it introduces key knowledge and skills which will be used and developed throughout the module. The criminal justice system appears in news, documentaries, drama, and fiction. Many people also have direct contact with it, whether through their work or as victims, suspects or witnesses. How accurately do those experiences reflect the system as a whole? How realistic are the impressions given in the media or in fiction? The sections examine statements you may believe about the criminal law. They explore whether these common ideas about criminal justice are truths, myths or a mixture of both. They may change your mind about the criminal justice system and should inspire you to learn more about the law. Criminal cases are tried by jury. There are many images associated with the criminal justice system. Some are symbols for example, the scales of justice represent law as a whole. Other images of the criminal justice system are more complex. For example, a criminal trial is often pictured as involving a red-robed judge, barristers in wigs and gowns, and a jury of 12 members of the public. This section will explore whether that picture is the truth, a myth, or a mixture of myth and truth. Truth. It is true that some criminal cases are tried by jury. In the Crown Court, the judge is in charge of the trial. Their role is to ensure that it runs smoothly and fairly, and to decide any questions of law. However, the jury decides whether the defendant, the accused person, is guilty or not guilty. The jury is made up of members of the public chosen at random from the electoral register. Because they are not legal professionals, they are referred to as lay people. They represent the community and use their life experience to help them make decisions. Myth. Most criminal cases are not tried by jury. This is because most are dealt with entirely by a magistrate's court, or because the defendant pleads guilty. There are two types of criminal courts which try and sentence defendants the magistrate's courts and the crown court. The magistrate's courts deal with the early stages of criminal cases, and with the trial and sentencing of less serious offences. Unlike the Crown Court, a magistrate's court does not have a jury. Young people under 18 have their cases heard in a special part of the magistrate's court, the youth court. This court can deal with most offences, even serious ones, and only the most serious cases involving young people, e.g. murder and manslaughter cases, will go to the Crown Court. The next part of the unit will explore what happens to a case in court. It will show how the magistrate's courts and Crown Court fit into the criminal justice system as well as what happens when the defendant pleads guilty or not guilty. The magistrate's court. All criminal cases start in a magistrate's court, where decisions are made by a panel of magistrates or a district judge, with no jury. The magistrate's court makes the first decisions about the defendant for example, whether to release them on bail or keep them in prison to await trial. Less serious cases, e.g. traffic offences, low-value shoplifting, are dealt with entirely by magistrate's courts. Only some more serious cases, e.g. robbery, murder, are sent from a magistrate's court to the Crown Court, where juries sit. You will learn more about this in Unit 2. Like juries, magistrates are lay people, and are often referred to as lay magistrates. They receive training, but they are not legally qualified. District judges, however, are qualified lawyers. In summary, all cases begin in a magistrate's court and most remain there. It begins with charge or summons, followed by the first hearings in the magistrate's court. If the case remains in the magistrate's court, and the defendant pleads guilty, the final stage is sentencing. If the defendant pleads not guilty, there will be a trial. If the defendant is found not guilty, the case ends. If the defendant is found guilty, the final stage is sentencing. If the case is sent to the Crown Court and the defendant pleads guilty, the final stage is sentencing. If the defendant pleads not guilty, there will be a trial. If the defendant is found not guilty, the case ends. If the defendant is found guilty, the final stage is sentencing. Guilty pleas. The defendant will be asked at an early stage to plead guilty or not guilty to the offence. If the defendant pleads not guilty, there will be a trial. However, if the defendant pleads guilty, they admit that they committed the crime. There is no need to hear evidence in a trial to decide whether the defendant is guilty. The court only has to decide their sentence, punishment. This is decided by the magistrates or judge, so no jury is needed. 
mixture, the claim that criminal cases are tried by jury is a mixture of myth and truth. Almost all criminal cases are dealt with entirely in a magistrate's court, which does not have a jury. Some more serious cases go to the Crown Court, where most defendants plead guilty. The tiny proportion of cases which go to the Crown Court and where the defendant pleads not guilty have a jury trial. However, as the courts deal with about 1.5 million cases every year, Ministry of Justice, 2020b, that still means tens of thousands of jury trials take place each year. Most judges are old, white men. For many people, the stereotype of a judge is an older, white man with an upper middle class accent. However, the judiciary has changed in recent years. How far have these changes gone? Truth. There is some truth in the image of the white, male judge. That is unsurprising given the history of the legal profession. To become a court judge, a person must already be an experienced lawyer. Lawyers are people who provide legal services, including solicitors and barristers. However, until 1919, only men could become barristers or solicitors. All barristers and pupils, trainee barristers, must belong to one of the four inns of court in London. Pupils must also complete qualifying sessions traditionally, by eating dinners at their inn before they can be called to the bar, i.e. formally qualify. While women had tried to join the inns of court before 1919, the inns refused to admit them. The Law Society, which was responsible for solicitors' regulation and education, would not let women take the exams needed to qualify as a solicitor. In 1914, four women brought a case against the Law Society. One but they lost. The courts ruled that women should continue to be excluded from the profession because that had been accepted practice for centuries. Ethnic minority men were not formally prohibited from becoming lawyers. However, the racism they faced made practicing in England and Wales very difficult. Most black and Asian barristers who qualified before the 20th century went on to practice in other countries of the British Empire. Magistrates. Magistrates have been part of the legal system since the Middle Ages. They were traditionally men from the landed gentry upper class landowners. Inevitably, they were almost all white. One exception was Nathaniel Wells, a magistrate in Wales at the start of the 19th century. The son of a wealthy plantation owner and an enslaved black woman, he inherited his father's wealth. He bought an estate in Chepstow and become part of Monmouthshire's landed gentry, the National Archives. Myth. There have been significant changes to the judiciary and legal profession in the last century and particularly in recent decades. The first woman to be appointed as a judge was Rose Heilbronn, who became a recorder, a part-time judge, in 1956. The first black recorder was Tunji Sawande, appointed in 1978. The statistics for other forms of diversity are less clear. Many lawyers choose not to declare their disability, sexuality, gender identity, religion, or socioeconomic background. Magistrates. 1919, the year the legal profession opened up to women, was also the year women could first become magistrates. Today, over half of magistrates are women, Magistrates Association, 2019. Ethnic diversity has taken longer to achieve. It would be another four decades before a minority ethnic magistrate, black magistrate, Eric Irons was appointed in 1962. By 2020, 16% of magistrates were members of ethnic minorities, Ministry of Justice, 2020C. Today's magistrates are volunteers from a range of backgrounds. However, there are still concerns about their socioeconomic diversity and age. In 2020, 82% were aged over 50, Ministry of Justice, 2020. Mixture, the perception of judges as being older white men is not entirely false. Women and people from ethnic minorities remain underrepresented among court judges, especially in the higher courts, such as the Court of Appeal. 32% of judges were women. 8% of judges identified as black, Asian or ethnic minority. 76% of judges were aged 50 or over, and 40% were 60 or over. Not all judges are old, white men but a disproportionate number are. Increasing diversity. The judiciary is becoming more diverse in terms of age, sex and ethnicity. The police enforce the law. In dramas and documentaries, the police detect crime and chase criminals. On the news, police officers manage crowds and hold press conferences when defendants are convicted and sentenced. It seems obvious that the police enforce the law, but is it true? Truth. The police have a duty to protect the public by preventing and detecting crime. 
the law also gives them special powers to help them carry out that duty. Police powers and duties. Police powers are intended to allow officers to perform their duty to prevent and detect crime. For example, they can search people, vehicles and buildings, collect evidence, arrest and question suspects, and move people, e. g. protesters, from locations. Types of law. Police powers and duties are set out in two types of law. Common law is made through cases heard before the courts. The police's duty to protect the public is a common law duty. Statute law is found in acts laws passed by parliament. Police powers are defined in statutes such as the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, PACE. Enforcing the law, the police investigate crime and gather evidence. They may identify and question suspects. They start the court process when they charge a suspect with an offence, either at the police station or by postal charge, a written charge sent to the suspect along with a postal requisition requiring them to attend court. For minor offences, the court process may start with a summons instead of a charge. The summons is a document requiring the accused person to attend court on a specific day. Myth. The police are not the only body to enforce the law. First, some offences are enforced by other agencies. Second, the police work closely with the Crown Prosecution Service, CPS, to decide whether to charge a suspect and to prepare cases for court. Other agencies. Parliament has given other bodies powers to investigate and prosecute certain crimes. These include Health and Safety Executive, Financial Conduct Authority, Food Standards Agency, Serious Fraud Office and Office of Fair Trading. An individual or organization can bring a private prosecution. Some organizations, including the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, RSPCA, regularly investigate and bring private prosecutions. Private prosecutions by individuals are unusual bringing a prosecution is costly and difficult. Crown Prosecution Service. This module focuses on prosecutions brought by the CPS and its head, the Director of Public Prosecutions. The Crown Prosecution Service, CPS, prosecutes criminal cases that have been investigated by the police and other investigative organizations in England and Wales. The CPS is independent, and we make our decisions independently of the police and government. Our duty is to make sure that the right person is prosecuted for the right offence, and to bring offenders to justice wherever possible. The CPS decides which cases should be prosecuted, determines the appropriate charges in more serious or complex cases, and advises the police during the early stages of investigations. Prepares cases and presents them at court and provides information, assistance and support to victims and prosecution witnesses. Mixture the police do enforce the law, using their powers and duties under statute and common law. They investigate offences and start the court process. However, they alone do not enforce the law they work closely with the CPS on their cases, and once a case goes to court the CPS is responsible for its prosecution. Some specialist offences are investigated and prosecuted by other bodies. Crimes are immoral. Are all crimes also moral wrongs? Truth. More serious criminal offences are also considered immoral. For example, murder, assault, and theft are generally considered morally, as well as legally, wrong. Morality and law. In 1962, one of the most senior judges of England and Wales, Viscount Simmons, said that the purpose of the criminal law is to enforce morality. The supreme and fundamental purpose of the law is to conserve not only the safety and order but also the moral welfare of the state. The law must be related to the changing standards of life not yielding to every shifting impulse of the popular will but having regard to fundamental assessments of human values and the purposes of society. Myth. Some crimes are not generally considered immoral, while opinions will differ on others. Is it immoral to cycle along a wide pavement to avoid a dangerous road junction? A distinction can be made between crimes which are serious and clearly immoral, and those which are minor and not considered, truly, criminal often called regulatory offences. Views about what is immoral can also change over time and vary widely between different people. For example, drink driving, driving a vehicle after consuming more than a minimal amount of alcohol, was not considered, truly, criminal a few decades ago. However, public opinion changed as people became more aware of the consequences of drink driving. Now, many people would consider it a, true, crime and an immoral act. Regulatory offences. Many offences are not, truly, criminal. They are regulatory offences, which are often punishable only by fines and may not have an obvious victim. Examples include driving offences, e.g., driving with a broken brake light, 
health and safety offences, e. g. minor breaches of regulations, offences regulating the sale of certain items, e. g. selling lottery tickets to a child under 16, reasons for criminalising, behaviour has sometimes been made illegal because it is immoral, however, there are other important reasons for making some actions a crime. One of the most influential factors in the current law of England and Wales is the harm principle. The harm principle. The harm principle was set out by philosopher and politician John Stuart Mill in 1859. The only purpose for which power can rightfully be exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. p. 14. In other words, the criminal law should only be used against someone when it is necessary to protect others from serious harm. Critics of the criminal justice system emphasize that crimes often protect certain parts of society at the expense of others. For example, feminist critiques focus on the ways that the law takes the interests of men as the norm, thereby failing to protect women from sexual and domestic violence. Critical race theory points out the institutional racism of the criminal justice system and consequences including disproportionate prosecutions of color. Other critiques emphasize that the law protects property owners and the middle class's benefit fraud is seen as more obviously criminal than, say, tax evasion. Immoral but not illegal. A lot of immoral behavior is not illegal. For example, cheating on a spouse or partner is not a crime. Mixture, morality and the criminal law overlap. One reason for making behavior a crime is that it is immoral. Most serious crimes are immoral, and most highly immoral acts are also criminal. For example, Murder is one of the most serious crimes and is also generally considered immoral. However, not all immoral acts are criminal, and not all crimes are immoral. In particular, regulatory offenses are often minor and may not be moral wrongs. Morality is not the only basis for deciding what should be a crime for example, the harm principle is also important. All crimes have victims. When crime is discussed, the victims of crime are often considered. Many crimes are discovered when a victim reports them to the police. It might therefore seem obvious that crimes have victims. But is that always true? Truth. The Code of Practice for Victims of Crime, Ministry of Justice, 2015, defines a victim as somebody who has suffered physical, mental or emotional harm or economic loss which was directly caused by a criminal offence. A close relative of someone whose death was caused by a criminal offence. Businesses and organizations may also be victims of crime. Some crimes may not have actual victims, but pose a risk to potential victims. Consider the following extract from a newspaper report. Nobody had been injured by speeding motorists, but campaigners were concerned that they might be in future. For many crimes, the victim is not, or not only, an individual, but society as a whole. For example, if there is a series of violent robberies in a town, the people who were robbed are the immediate victims. However, many other people in the town will feel less safe and may change their behavior as a result. Myth. Some crimes are victimless. For example, if a person drives along a quiet lane with a broken brake light, nobody else may be affected by their actions. Similarly, someone who grows cannabis for their own use in their own home is unlikely to harm anyone else. Nonetheless, both have committed crimes. Mixture. Many crimes have victims, and the most serious crimes cause grave harms to their victims. However, that is not true of all crimes. And sometimes, it is unclear who is really the victim of a crime. Convicted criminals are let off without prison sentences. You have probably seen headlines talking about criminals who escaped prison or calling for tougher sentences. It might seem that a lot of criminals are being let off rather than sent to prison. This section will look at how the courts punish people convicted of crimes in order to explore whether that is true. Truth. Most people convicted of a crime do not go to prison. In the year to March 2020, over a million people were convicted of offences. Only 7% were imprisoned, 78% were fined. Ministry of Justice, 2020. Myth. Most people who did not go to prison were not let off. Prison is only one punishment available to the criminal courts and is usually not the most appropriate one. The majority of offenders were convicted of motoring offences or other minor offences. Even for more serious crimes, a prison sentence may not be the best way of punishing the offender. Sentences. The court has a range of sentences to choose from. Imprisonment is one of these, but other punishments include. A suspended sentence the person does not actually go to prison if they commit no further offenses over a set period of time. A community sentence, e. 
g. Unpaid work in the community or supervision by a probation officer, or participation in an alcohol or drug treatment program. A fine or financial penalty paid to the court. Disqualification from an activity such as driving or being a company director. An order relating to treatment for mental illness. A conditional discharge the person is not punished now, but if they commit a further offence within a certain period of time they will be punished for the current offence too. Purposes of punishment. To decide whether a punishment is appropriate, it is important to consider its purpose. There are many reasons for punishing someone who has committed a crime, and this section considers the most important. Deterrence. A harsh sentence may discourage the person from committing more offences in the future. This is known as individual deterrence it deters a specific person from offending. The sentence may also be used to discourage other people from committing similar offences. This is general deterrence it deters people in general from offending. Any punishment can be a deterrent the threat of being fined deters many people from speeding, for example. However, deterrence assumes that people make rational decisions about whether to commit an offence. It also works only if people believe that they are likely to be caught and convicted. Incapacitation. Prison sentences are a form of incapacitation they remove a person from society so that they cannot offend against the public. However, they may commit offences while in prison, e.g. against other prisoners or staff. Rehabilitation. One way to stop people from committing further offences is to rehabilitate them by reforming them and giving them the skills to avoid further offending. Some rehabilitation does take place in prisons, e.g through education, work experience, or addiction treatment programs. However, it might be better achieved through community sentences where the offender receives specialist support in their own community. Retribution. Retribution, or just deserts, aims to inflict suffering on the offender equivalent to that inflicted on their victim. It does not always require harsh punishment the punishment should match the crime. In other words, a lesser crime should receive a lesser punishment. For example, Imprisonment may be out of proportion to the harm caused by an offence such as shoplifting. Reparation. Reparation aims to return a situation to how it was before the crime. For example, the defendant might replace something they took from the victim or pay them compensation for an injury sustained. They might do unpaid work to repay their community for the harm they caused. Some types of reparation can be part of a defendant's punishment for example, unpaid work as part of a community order. The court can order other types or reparation, such as paying compensation to the victim, in addition to the defendant's punishment. Mixture, while most people convicted of crimes are not imprisoned, they are punished in other ways. However, punishment is often controversial. Appropriate punishments can be difficult to decide. Criminal law and civil law are completely different. One of the most important distinctions the legal system makes is between criminal and civil law. You will see that each has its own processes and purposes. However, is it true that they are completely different? Truth. The criminal justice system is separate from the civil justice system. The two systems have different courts, procedures and parties. These differences reflect the distinct purposes they serve. The purpose of the criminal justice system is to punish those who commit crimes. Many crimes have individual victims. However, crimes are also considered to have been committed against society as a whole. The prosecution is therefore brought by the state. By contrast, the civil court's purpose is to resolve disputes between individuals and put things right between the two sides, not to punish them. Typically, the person who is in the wrong is ordered to pay damages a sum of money to the other person. For example, if Zofia and Ahmed make a contract, a legally binding agreement, that Zofia will sell her car to Ahmed for £5,000, but Ahmed only gives her £4,000, the court may order him to pay the outstanding balance. Ahmed will then have the car and Zofia will have the full price, just as they had agreed. The court will not punish him with an additional fine. The different purposes of the criminal and civil justice systems mean that there are important differences in the ways they operate. These include their courts, decision makers, parties and levels of proof. Different courts. All criminal cases begin in the magistrate's courts, and some of the more serious ones are transferred to the crown court. Decisions in magistrates' court cases can be appealed to the Divisional Court of the High Court, or to the Crown Court. Appeals from the Crown Court are heard by the Criminal Division of the Court of Appeal. Cases which raise points of particular importance may be appealed from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court, which hears appeals from both civil and criminal cases. 
Before 2009, the highest court in the United Kingdom was known as the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords, usually referred to simply as the House of Lords. In October 2009, it was replaced as the highest court by the Supreme Court. Older cases therefore refer to the House of Lords rather than the Supreme Court. Most civil cases are heard in the county court, while very serious or complex cases are dealt with by the High Court. The types of civil cases heard in magistrates' courts are very limited. They include alcohol licensing appeals, enforcing council tax demands, and certain family law proceedings. Decisions in both county court and magistrates' court cases can be appealed to the divisional courts of the High Court. Appeals from the High Court are heard by the Civil Division of the Court of Appeal. Cases which raise points of particular importance may be appealed from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court, before October 2009 formally to the House of Lords, which hears both civil and criminal cases. Different decision-makers, the criminal courts are concerned with wrongs done to the community as a whole. They therefore involve laypeople, non-lawyers, from the community, who sit as jurors and magistrates. Because the civil courts are concerned with private disputes between individuals, they do not need to involve laypeople. Decisions are almost always made by legally qualified judges. Criminal courts. Magistrates' courts. A panel of lay magistrates or a legally trained district judge decide questions of law and fact. Crown Court. A legally trained judge decides questions of law. A lay jury decides questions of fact, i.e., whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty. Civil Courts. County Court. A legally trained judge decides questions of law and fact. High Court. A legally trained judge decides questions of law and fact. Different parties. In a criminal case, the people on each side the parties are the prosecution and defendant. When the CPS brings a prosecution, it does so on behalf of the state. The defendant is the accused individual. Criminal case names usually have the format RV, defendant. R is short for Regina or Rex, Latin for Queen or King, the head of state. In other words, the prosecutor represents the crown or state. In a civil case, the parties are the claimant and defendant. The claimant is the person, or organization, asking the court to order the defendant to do something. The defendant is the person, or organization, against whom the claim is made. Civil case names usually have the format, claimant name, v, defendant name. Different levels of proof. Burden of proof. The burden of proof is the obligation to prove the overall case or an element of it. The general rule in both criminal and civil cases is that whoever starts the case has the overall burden of proof. Therefore the prosecution has the burden of proof in a criminal case and the claimant has the burden of proof in a civil case. Standard of proof. The standard of proof is the level to which the case has to be proved. The criminal standard is very different from the civil standard. In a criminal case, the prosecution is brought by the state, which has huge powers and resources. By contrast, the defendant is usually an individual, whose liberty may be at stake. The standard of proof is therefore beyond reasonable doubt the court must only convict the defendant if it is sure of their guilt. In a civil case, the parties are, in theory, at least, more evenly matched. They are usually individuals or organizations, not representatives of the state. The standard of proof is therefore on the balance of probabilities in order to win, the claimant must show their case is more likely than not to be true. Myth. Civil and criminal law have different court systems and purposes, but they are not completely separate. In fact, they are often dealing with the same or overlapping situations. In order to understand how criminal and civil justice overlap, this section will follow a case study from the original event to the end of legal proceedings. Shanice was driving to work at 8 a.m. on the 5th of March at the same time that Arjun was driving his young children to school. The children started arguing in the back seat. Distracted by their shouting, Arjun failed to notice Shanice's car approaching as he made a right turn. His car hit hers, causing damage to both cars. The police and an ambulance attended the scene, where Arjun admitted what had happened. Shanice suffered a concussion and broken ribs. She had to take four weeks off work to recover. The car accident will lead to proceedings in both the criminal and civil courts. Arjun is fined and receives six penalty points on his driving license. He is not ordered to pay compensation the criminal court does not usually make a compensation order in a road traffic accident case. While the criminal court has punished Arjun for his careless driving, it has not compensated Shanice for her injuries or financial losses. She will therefore need to start a civil case.
Shanice brings a claim for the civil wrong of negligence. A person is negligent if they fail to take reasonable care and, as a result, cause loss, harm, or injury to someone else. The central question will be similar to that in the criminal court whether Arjun's driving was of an adequate standard. Arjun's guilty plea in the magistrate's court can be used as evidence in the civil case. The civil court will not punish Arjun. It will order him to pay compensation to Shanice. That compensation will include an amount for the pain and suffering her injuries caused her, as well as the cost of repairing the damage to her car, any wages she lost, and any expenses she incurred as a result of the accident. Mixture, the criminal and civil legal systems have different aims and purposes, different laws, and different courts. However, they also overlap the same incident can give rise to both civil and criminal proceedings. Sometimes, the criminal and civil courts use the same legal rules. For example, the crime of gross negligence manslaughter uses the civil law test for negligence plus an additional requirement that the negligence must be gross. Summary. This unit considered how the criminal justice system differs from its popular image. By exploring these ideas and considering whether they are true, it introduced the court system and the people who work in it, as well as the purposes of criminal law and punishment. It considered who brings criminal cases to court, which Unit 2 will explore in more detail. You should now be able to explain some key features of the criminal justice system. Describe some key features of the criminal law. Please like, comment and subscribe. Good morning, good afternoon and good night learners.